Welcome to the Hudson Institute. I'm Brian Clark, a senior fellow at the Institute and director of the Hudson Center for Defense Concepts and Technology. I'm here today with uh, Dan Pat, who is an adjunct fellow at the Center uh, and also a researcher with us at the Defense Concepts and Technology Center. We're honored today to have as our guest, uh, the Acting Secretary of the Army, John Whitley. Uh, thank you very much for being here, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for having me. Uh, Secretary Whitley has a, a long distinguished career. Um, I'll give you a quick, quick rundown. Um, He's been the acting secretary since earlier this year uh, when the new administration came in office in January. Prior to that, um, uh, Secretary Whitley had been the assistant secretary of the Army for financial management and comptroller. Uh, he'd been in that job since 2018. And prior to that, he'd been at the Institute for Defense Analysis. Uh, secretary Whitley was born in Florida, grew up in Maryland, uh, attended the Virginia Polytechnic Institute, uh, and served after that in the Army in the 2nd Ranger Battalion. Uh, following his uh, service in the Army, he got a PhD from the University of Chicago in economics, uh, one of the great schools of economics out there, uh, and then uh, went on to a series of jobs doing analysis of both at the Military Compensation and Retirement Modernization Commission, uh, at the Trachtenberg School for Public Policy and Public Administration at George Washington University, where he was an adjunct professor, and also at the Home Department of Homeland Security, where he was director of program analysis and uh, evaluation. And after that, he was at the uh, Institute for Defense Analysis. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you very much for being here, uh, Dr. Whitley. And um, uh, to start out, um, I think we should uh, probably address the uh, elephant in the room, which is the defense budget. Um, the defense budget is getting released today. And um, some of the, some of the uh, discussion in recent weeks has been about the Army, how it's going to fare in the budget, uh, the challenges the Army is going to face in terms of balancing modernization with readiness, uh, and uh, uh, trying to make the army better able to address great power competition. Um, so kind of where do you see the army today and um, how do you think the budget reflects the, the, the strategy and the priorities that the army is trying to pursue? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Brian. Thank you for asking it. You know, to understand the army, the budget today, and then the, the 22 budget uh, that we'll be talking about over the coming months, uh, it, it's helpful to go back just a few years and think about uh, uh, how we got to where we are. So if you go back about four or five years, you'll find uh, the Department of Defense in the sequester period. And you'll find that uh, we were really having problems with readiness. Readiness had really atrophied at that time. And so uh, uh, we did, uh, with the help of Congress, uh, we had some significant budget increases, uh, particularly the 17 to 18 budget. Uh, and we really started a process there that took a few years to complete and that really uh, rebuilt uh, readiness. Uh, you know, I can speak for the Army, but I think uh, much of the department uh, experienced a very similar uh, trend there. So, so readiness is in a very good place right now. And uh, also, the other kind of key factor to think through here is, is, you know, we're coming out of almost now 20 years of counter-VEO, counter-violent extremist organization uh, conflict. And during that time, our adversaries, particularly our near-peer adversaries, they were able to, one, watch us and see what our capabilities were, and two, uh, they were able to invest. Well, you know, we, we were investing as best we could. We were also, you know, our primary focus was on fighting uh, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So uh, we had a period there, an extended period, where our adversaries were able to invest and, and uh, began to put at risk some of our, some of our overmatch. So uh, when you look at the last now few years, we rebuilt readiness. And then the second big priority was we had to, to really start embarking on significant modernization. And that was to, to maintain our overmatch. If we, if we don't modernize, you know, we lose that overmatch, which, makes, uh, which would make a conflict with a near peer adversary uh, more likely and would make the consequences of it uh, more severe. So, the, uh, so we started a very significant modernization. And, and for the Army, you know, this is, uh, for those folks who know the Army, you know, we do this about every 40 years, right? You know, we, we modernized in 1940, uh, just in time for World War II. Uh, the next big wave was the 1980s, and here we are in the 2020s. And we had done incremental uh, improvements of those 1980s systems, and those systems are iconic for the American people, the Abrams, the Apache, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Chinook, uh, the Blackhawk. But 
Uh, but there's only so far you can go with incremental improvements. And to maintain overmatch, we really need to do systematic modernization. And so we've started that. Uh, and we're and we're well underway. Uh, we we not only did that uh, by starting to fund new programs, but we did that by changing the way we were structured. Uh, so we created the Army Futures Command. Uh, we fundamentally uh, changed the way we approach and, and interact with industry, et cetera. So so we are now uh, uh, under a very with a very good start at modernization. And and, and really, the Army's kind of uh, become one of the leaders uh, in the department now at kind of. Uh, developing and fielding new technologies. So that's that was a long-winded way. I apologize for the time there, but that was a long-winded way of saying, where are we today? The Army's in a very good place. Uh, we've restored readiness. Readiness is in a good place. And we're uh, uh, in the early stages of, of the most comprehensive modernization plan uh, in 40 years. The The converse of that, though, is, is how did we get that modernization? You know, the, the Army's budget has largely been flat since that uh, readiness rebuild period. And so what we did was we, we've largely realigned uh, money uh, from within uh, to fund that modernization. And, and those familiar with the Army will know our night court process that's become kind of the term of art uh, where we've been uh, cutting programs. Uh, and these weren't programs that were bad. These were programs that were just simply lower priority uh, than our modernization program. So, so we've been uh, the 2020 to 24 cycle, the 2021 to 25 budget cycle, and now what we're rolling out today, the 2022 uh, to 26 cycle. Over those three cycles, uh, over those uh, extended years of time, we've now real, realigned over uh, about $45 billion worth of resources uh, from within the Army to uh, this uh, modernization plan. So, uh, so the the good is uh, readiness is in a good place, and we're we're well along the way on modernization. The bad is uh, we have self-funded a lot, a large part of that modernization, and to do that we had to run the night court process, and we we've, we've wrung out uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of what uh, 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 we use the expression in D.C. a lot, right? The low hanging fruit. You know, well, we've gone after the low hanging fruit, then we went after the, the fruit midway up the tree. We're standing at the top of the tree now, uh, uh, looking for uh, more fruit to harvest. So, so there, there's some risk in, in, in the Army's budget and we have to be cognizant of that. Um, so now we're rolling out 22. 22 is a tight uh, budget for the Department of Defense as a whole and it's a very tight budget uh, for the Army. So what were we able to do in that tight budget? Well, the first thing we said is we need to protect those readiness gains. Uh, you take your foot, what we learned in sequester is you take your foot off readiness, uh, you take your foot off the gas uh, for readiness and it can turn on a dime. So we're gonna, we think, uh, we worked very hard in this budget formulation, despite the risks that's in the Army budget, despite the challenges that we face, we've worked very hard to preserve readiness. And we think we're cautiously optimistic that we've done so and that we will not see a readiness decline. We've, we've tried to make readiness a little more efficient and, and if there's questions later, I can elaborate on that but we're uh, trying to uh, preserve readiness. The second is uh, that modernization plan. That's the, the fight in the far future if we, uh, heaven forbid, if we end up in a conflict with a near career adversary. So we protected modernization in this budget and we have uh, maintained uh, the funding to what we call our 31 plus four, you know, our priority uh, modernization program. So what had to give? It's a very tight budget. Uh, we, we lose buying power in this budget. So what, what had to give? Um, uh, the two things, the two broad categories really that had to give were, were operations today. So we maintained readiness, that's the fight tonight, uh, but operations today. Uh, we run a very high uh, op tempo in the Army. Uh, uh, we had in 21, uh, we just had a, a, an enormous year of, of, of unplanned and increased, uh, which we can get into uh, operational demands, which we can get into in later questions if relevant. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're taking some risks there. Um, and then the second place is that near-term fight. That's where you're rolling out incremental improvements to your existing systems. And we've had to slow some of those incremental improvements. So that's the fight over the next couple of years. Uh, we're taking risk against that as well. And that's what you're gonna see uh, when we roll the budget out. Another part of that is end strength. Uh, uh, we did have planned in the 2021 to 25 cycle, we did have planned end strength growth and we had to cut that uh, end strength growth. Uh, which is again, is a risk against uh, the, the near term, the next few year fight. Yeah, so Dr. Whitley, yeah. we know that China has mm -hmm. increased its efforts to assert regional hegemony in the Pacific. 
including coercive measures. Yep. Can you tell us a little bit about what the army is doing in the Pacific? Any activities to counter China's strategy in the region? In the region, and um, any of the ways that that is driving the modernization initiatives that that you've discussed? Well, I, I think there's a couple of dimensions to that answer. I, I you know, one is obviously uh, conflict, and you know, if we were to end up in conflict in that region, and so that gets into a whole host of investments that we're making in the modernization portfolio. So, uh, uh, perhaps the uh, the most obvious one, or the one that gets talked about the most, is the long range fires and the, and the hypersonic weapons. And you know, we're going to be fielding um, uh, our first battery of hypersonic weapons in, in FY23. One of the things you won't actually see this, uh, specifically in the 22 rollout because it's focused on the 22 year, but one thing we did in the, in the 2022 to 26 cycle was we actually added another battery in the app years, uh, and accelerated, uh, the battery. So, so you'll see, you won't see the fit up in the budget rollout, but in that fit up that future years defense program, we now have three batteries. Uh, for uh, long-range hypersonic weapons. So one is on the conflict side, and that's probably uh, perhaps the most obvious example there. The other, which which may have been uh, in part where you're going, was what about in competition and deterrence, and and how do you think about the region? And what we found, this is actually a lesson learned for me uh, here over the last four months coming in uh, as the acting secretary of the army, is uh, you know uh, I've learned a lot about uh, the role the army is playing in that. Uh, competition phase or, or the phase we're in now where we're interacting we're, and we're trying to prevent uh, things from escalating and bad things from ultimately happening. And when you look across the region, you talked about uh, uh, coercive measures and the like, you know, what we're finding is a lot of uh, our partners and potential partners in the region, you know, when I came in, I probably thought the question was, we have to persuade them to uh, align themselves with us uh, as opposed to China. And I, what I'm finding is the question is actually a little bit different than that. They know we're the better partner. They know we're the partner of, of collaboration, the partner of, of to reuse the word partnership, uh, as opposed to the partner of coercion. What they want, though, what I'm finding, what they want, a lot of them is, you know, so they know the U.S. is a better friend. But they also know what neighborhood they live in, and they know how miserable uh, the, the, big, uh, the big guy in the neighborhood can make uh, uh, their life in the neighborhood. So what they want is they want mechanisms by which they can build relationships, uh, establish partnerships, but do it in a, in a small, a scalable, and enduring way. Uh, that could build the things in the future, that could lay foundations for the future, but doesn't force them to go out today and say, you know what, uh, neighbor, uh, I don't like you anymore, and I'm, I'm with these guys over here. And, and so that's where I, where I found is, is the Army is ideally suited for that. In a lot of these countries, uh, the chief of the military is Army. Uh, uh, they, they feel very comfortable uh, when the Army comes and, and we have conversations. Uh, we speak kind of the same language. And what they're looking for are these kind of small, scalable uh, engagements uh, that kind of help to build uh, partnership, help to build capacity for them, uh, and then that can become enduring. So, you know, when we look across the region, we're having you know very good conversations with, for example, uh, Indonesia. They're they're interested in building a combat training center. So we're talking to them about that. Uh, you know, there was a lot of activity last year in India. India was, was uh, you know, actually in a, uh, a shooting uh, war with, uh, uh, with their, uh, uh, with their uh, bordering country there. Uh, so we helped with cold weather gear. We helped with artillery. Uh, we're doing uh, some vehicle work with Thailand. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got warehouses uh, in a lot of countries. We, we, we have warehouses for humanitarian assistance uh, here in Vietnam. Um, we have our SFABs, our uh, Security Force Assistance Brigades, uh, uh, which uh, for those who aren't familiar, that's where we put together uh, kind of a more of a senior level unit that can go in and, and advise and assist and, and help train uh, uh, local forces. Uh, we've got, I get, I get a weekly report of where our SFABs are at. We're, you know, and, and any day, I, I, I haven't really seen this week, so I don't know where we're at today, but in any day we're in, uh, you know, 10 to 12, sometimes even uh, more than that countries in the Indo-Pacific uh, area of responsibility uh, with those SFAB teams. Uh, and some places it would surprise folks. So, it, you know, it's very uh, promising there. So, uh, so uh, you know, this is one where I've learned a lot in the last four months. Uh, uh, we've got a lot of activity going on in coordination with the rest of the department. I think the, the whole department has a lot of activity going on. Uh, and I certainly see what the Army's doing, and it's a lot.
The, um, so, uh, Dr. Whitley, that's a, a very interesting uh, lead into this discussion about readiness. But uh, one question I had uh, before we get to that is uh, one of the challenges as a Navy guy that I hear from other navies in the region, in the, in the yeah. Asia Pacific or Indo Pacific, is how navies ne don't necessarily have the persistence uh, that they would prefer. So, um, last year there was this West Capella uh, drill rig incident where um, we came to intervene on the behalf of the Malaysians against the Chinese who were trying to prevent them from drilling in their own EZ. Yeah. Uh, but then our ships left and then the Malaysians and the Vietnamese kind of felt like, okay, well now the bully is going to start to bully us again because you guys can't be here every day. Um, do you find that the that that's something that they find uh, more, more comforting with the army presence is that it is this, this persistent um, even uh, even though it's at a lower level of, uh, of uh, size, maybe it's a lower level of escalation, but it's a more persistent presence than what you might get from a Navy or Air Force. Uh, I mean, yes, I do. I want to word that carefully, right? Because yeah. it's, you know, it takes all instruments right. working together. So it's not it's not us or the Navy or us yeah. or the Air Force or the Air right. Force or the Navy. I mean, it's all of us together yeah. uh, is what it's going to take to, right. to prevent a bad outcome in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, or uh, and if a bad outcome emerges to to, to fight and win uh, that conflict. So the first caveat to what I'm about to say yeah, is, yeah, yeah. is it, it takes it's it is not either or it's both. Uh, but but the specific answer is yes, we do find uh, that there is uh, uh, that they do view uh, uh, they they want both. Uh, they do view the army uh, at times as being uh, a, an enduring partner, which they like. And I would actually add it. Uh, I would actually add, you know, um, we recently released our Arctic strategy. And when you think about the Arctic, right, and you think about our uh, posture in Alaska and how we're trying to think through how we might change and enhance our posture in Alaska, you know, what we found there, and I, you know, again, I don't want to, you know, our sister services are doing tremendous work everywhere they're at. So I don't want to get in front of them. But what we found is actually some receptivity to saying, well, wait a second, if you could do the mission. Uh, up through the Bering Strait, if you could do some of these missions up there with an enduring on the ground presence uh, that can reach out and touch those places, that prevents me from having to constantly be rotating forces out there. Uh, and that might actually be a good thing. That might free up my forces to be more productive and effective uh, in other regions. So again, these are all, you know, I, I don't want to get in front of, of where, where my sister services are yeah. at or other types of things, but that's the kind of conversation that's going on right now. Uh, where we see, uh, for example, from Alaska into uh, portions of the Arctic, where uh, we could create an enduring presence that would uh, provide benefit uh, to our partners. Yeah, it's very complementary. You know, so they're they're not intended to be you know, competitive, but uh, yeah. especially in places like the Arctic, it's very difficult to operate up there, obviously because mm -hmm. of the weather, but also because there's no infrastructure ashore. You know, so if right. you deploy up there, it's a long deployment, uh, and there's no place to go if you need fuel or you right. got a you know, get somebody off the boat. I've had that experience. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that having an army presence ashore was probably, a, in a lot of ways, an easier way to get some of those capabilities out there. Yep. Um, so that gets to the question of readiness. So you talked about op tempo, and the army's op yep. tempo has been very, uh, very high. You know, ever since uh, you know, in two thousand one. But um, I don't think people realize, um, even with the drawdown in the Middle East, the army's op tempo has stayed very high. Uh, and it's much more dispersed than it was, yep. you know, previously. So, what are some of the things? What are some of the things driving the op tempo for the army? I assume the Asia Pacific is one of the big drivers, uh, with mm -hmm. the increase in presence and the increase in in support that we're providing to allies yep. and partners there. Yep. So, so uh, a couple of things. Uh, 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 one of my one of my statistics that I've been uh, trotting out, you know, is the army is twenty five percent of the budget. We're 35 percent of the active duty force. Now we're we're 45 if you do total force because we have a big part of the reserve. We're 45 percent of the reserve, but 25 percent of budget, 35 percent of the active force, 45 if you can. We're over 50 percent of the operational demands uh, on the department. So uh, so it and we feel that uh, we feel that in the budget. We feel that in the the stress on our forces, uh, and it's a it's a real challenge uh, for the army. Um, in terms of uh, you know we we get. We get hit with the regular uh, posture. You know, we have seventy thousand folks in the PACOM AOR, Indo PACOM AOR. Uh, we have, uh, I don't know, I think I wrote the number down somewhere. Uh, we're about thirty thousand in Europe. Um, uh, uh, we have uh, last year we executed sixty-four brigade equivalent deployments and moved 40, 45,000 pieces of equipment through fifty-five ports of embarkation and debarkation. So we're we are busy. Last year, or I'm sorry, uh, over the last uh, twelve months, you know, uh, uh, what 
an additional factor on top of all that was the emergent demands. So we have southwest border. We have 3,000, 3,700 or so down there now. Uh, everybody's familiar with now with uh, particularly those of us who live here uh, in the region know about the D.C. Uh, security. Uh, and, you know, I'll, I'll take a second. Uh, I know you're asking, uh, you know, hard probing uh, uh, questions, but I need to brag just a little bit. You know, our National Guard, and this was the Army and the Air National Guard, our National Guard in less than two weeks moved 25,000 people uh, prior to the inauguration. Uh, to uh, Washington, D.C., and pulled them out of jobs, uh, got them on a plane, got them to D.C., got them trained for this mission, got them deputized with arrest authority, and put them on the Capitol and throughout the city uh, to ensure we had a peaceful uh, and safe uh, inauguration. So uh, when we talk about uh, the capabilities of our National Guard, uh, uh, nobody should ever doubt uh, their capabilities. You know, so so it's all the stuff that you're familiar with that you know. I'll, I'll put out one or two, though, um, that folks might not know as much. And, and these aren't big force structure drivers. These aren't big people things. But, uh, but in COVID, everybody knows we were out working in hospitals, delivering care. Everybody knows we've been out uh, delivering vaccines now. And we've had thousands and thousands of people. You know, the guards had 20 to 30,000 folks out uh, on that support. One thing I, I think a lot of folks don't know is we provided most of the back office support for Operation Warp Speed and the entire vaccine effort. So, uh, you know, when you think about the millions and millions of vaccines that have been delivered across this country, uh, you know, it was an army contracting officer uh, behind the scenes that made that happen. It was a, an entire army team. And now, now, you know, that's in the hundreds, that's not in the tens of thousands of people, but, but even hundreds of people is a, is a heavy demand. Uh, and, uh, uh, but every shot going in those CVSs across the country or those would, I don't want to be uh, any other store, brand store as well. Uh, uh, you know, it was probably, I mean, I'm sure there's a few exceptions. It was probably an army contracting officer, military or civilian, uh, with an army program office that actually was, was the force behind buying, distributing, et cetera, uh, that vaccine. Uh, one last one is uh, the unaccompanied children challenge on the border right now. Uh, we're, ho we're housing al almost 5,000 at Fort Bliss. Now that's not a big manpower requirement on us. Department of Health and Human Services provides some manpower for that, but it's still uh, a drain on our resources. It's still our land. Uh, uh, we had to do a lot of uh, the folks down at Fort Bliss have been working very hard to help HHS uh, address that mission. So um, it, it, it's, it's, it's being engaged in combat in the Middle East while being engaged in Europe in uh, the Indo-Pacific and everywhere else and then a whole host of domestic and other uh, challenges uh, uh, that come up uh, as well. And so even with the, um, the sustained uh, demand on the force um, and the constrained budget environment, uh, you were able to continue to, to fund readiness to a level that prevents us from going back to that readiness yeah, crisis we had in for us is, is, is it becomes There becomes competition between current yeah. operations and readiness, right? Well, I guess that's what you're getting at. Yeah. So, you know, that, and that's a challenge for us in 22, right? It's gonna be a very tight budget. We're gonna lose buying power. We lose buying power in the 22 budget. Right. Uh, we funded readiness. We took risk against current operations. What we need to make that work is current operations to come down. Right. Right. If current operations don't come down, we have now a year of execution bill and that year of execution bill becomes either, do we raid readiness, uh, which we yep. don't want to do, uh, or can we find relief for that? So that's the, that's the math. Uh, the calculus of, of the budget. We have taken risk we, we, uh, against current operations. And so, uh, you know, we're hoping that the demand signal goes down. Yeah, that makes sense. Or, or, you, or we have to return these to the idea of supplemental funding, I assume. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dan, do you want to? Yeah, Dr. That, Whitley, if we, could, if we could turn our lens uh, back to modernization for a minute. Yeah. Certainly the department's buzz talking about all domain. And for its part, the Army is, is pursuing uh, a multi-domain operations concept, right? That emphasizes right. distribution and mobility yep. to, to gain yep. access and, and, and erode an opponent's defenses. But when we look at the Army's modernization initiatives, they don't seem to be planning to incorporate new offensive or defensive fire systems into lower echelon units. Mm -hmm. When we look at the networks like IBCS and, and Titan, they are organized around relatively, um, you know, large and, and immobile uh, op centers talks. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you see this? How, how does the Army's modernization efforts, how do they achieve the agility and, and the distribution that you would need for a concept like MDO? Yeah, so so I think, uh, 
you know, I would probably, I mean, you're getting a little operational for me, right? But I'm going to do the best I can here, right? So uh, I would probably challenge your framing a little bit, right? Because I think, you know, I see we are, uh, we are feeling stuff. In fact, uh, some of our first big modernization efforts that are materializing on OTAs, our other transaction authorities, one of the first big ones that we're fielding this year is the M Shore ad, uh, which is, you know, uh, uh, a striker vehicle that we've put uh, you know, uh, defensive systems on for UAVs, uh, rotary ring. I think we could even get some fixed wings with that. So we've got M Shore, and we're fielding that uh, uh, this year. We're uh, fielding the, the first handful in Europe right now. And that's, uh, you know, so that's an operational level. That's a, a brigade and below level system. Um, uh, it's very exciting. Uh, it's got, you know, we're, we're gonna, it's gonna take time to get it exactly right. Uh, and then, but, you know, and then we have another variant of that and, and General Murray, I, I'm not sure if it's next year or the year after General Murray can, can get us uh, the right facts there. Uh, but then we're gonna have a directed energy variant of that. So when you think about modernization, you know, taking a striker, putting some kinetic uh, weapons on it, that's, that's modernization, that's nice. That's not revolutionary though. If we can get the directed energy variant uh, working next year, uh, and then we're gonna go into an experimentation phase where we think about what the unit will look like uh, the mix between the kinetic variant and the directed energy variant, uh, uh, and uh, what we'll learn from that. So if we can get a unit that has directed energy defensive weapons in it, uh, integrated into a concept on how that unit's going to operate at the brigade and below level, um, I would say that's, you know, that's the, uh, uh, one, it'll be, you know, that's a, that's a huge stair step in technology, getting directed energy into the field in an operationally relevant way. Uh, and then two, uh, that's a great uh, concept of modernization of how we're gonna be integrating the directed energy and the, and the kinetic uh, variant. So, so, so let me, maybe my answer is to some extent, uh, question, question the framing there a little bit. I, I think, uh, you know, if PIC is gonna, is, is, is that an operational, has an operational, uh, that's our uh, uh, in, indirect, uh, I have their acronym written down, indirect fire uh, protection systems. Uh, and then um, LTAMs, is, uh, you know, we, we got a lot that's gonna, that's gonna happen at the brigade level. The, another one I'd say is, uh, and thinking about MDO and thinking about information and thinking about JADC2 and thinking about all the challenges that we face is, is IVAST, right? We've got, and, and, and not just IVAST, but we've got our night vision goggles, binocular going out this year. We've got IVAST that'll start at the end of this calendar year, hopefully, uh, and be uh, out uh, first unit fielded uh, by next year. Um, you know, both of these are, are uh, you know, you know uh, night vision goggles is, is, is an incremental improvement there. IVAS is a first attempt to get virtual and augmented reality in the field. They are great. That's going to be exciting, right? But really, uh, to me, the most exciting thing is, is what comes after them, right? Uh, when you think about IVAS in 2030 or 2035, and you think about JADC2, you think about multi-domain operations, you think about the information flow, uh, uh, and what we could be doing in 2030 uh, at the unit level, you, you know, um, uh, the potential there is unlimited. So, so I guess my answer is, I think we are doing it at, at, at all levels uh, throughout the organization. So, uh, yeah, thanks so, for that. Those are those are certainly exciting developments. Sorry, Brian. Back, back to you. No problem. No problem. Uh, the um, so that kind of raises a question uh, for me of. Uh, what it seems like is uh, you're talking about an army that is uh, looking to better equip at the brigade and below level, um, yep. trying to push these capabilities out to smaller units that are going to be then uh, able to distribute, you know, to a degree, greater degree, which is sort of inherent in the um, MDO concept. Yep. Um, is, is, that, is that where we're going, is trying to get to this smaller unit uh, organizational construct for the Army? Well, well I um, think that's part of it. I, I would also say we're experimenting with what the units look like, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and, and, you know, right now, and this would be, this would be to, to the prior question to Dan's point, right? This is at a higher level right now we're experimenting with the multi-domain task force. And so, you know, if you say, well, well, you know, look, that's echelon above brigade, that's a theater asset. Fair enough, fair point. But, 
But what we're doing with that right now is experimenting with it, right? We don't know what the 2030 version of that looks like. We don't know what the 2030, uh, you know, long range hypersonic battery or our, our mid range capability or space sensing interrelated with uh, command and control. We don't know what that looks like in 2030. So yes, right now we have the multi-domain task force. But I would, you know, I think the right way to think about that is that's an experiment, right? What we're doing right now is we're we're putting it into the Pacific in different configurations and seeing what it works or what not. We're putting it in Europe in different configurations to see what works, to see what doesn't work. Uh, you know, the next time we put it out in the Pacific, we'll put it out in a different way. We'll put it out in a different place. We'll put it out in a different way with different pieces and parts uh, attached to it. So, you know, so I don't know, you know, I can't say, and, and there's probably experts in the army that have pretty good feel for this, but I, you know, as a secretary of the army, I, I can't say which bits of that are going to be theater assets in 2030, which bits of that would be theater assets, which bits of that would be at the core of the vision or the yeah. brigade or, or whatever uh, level. And then you look at other things we're experimenting and, and AFC, the Army Futures Command has a software factory, right? Where we're taking uh, folks from all across the army uh, and teaching them the code and teaching them to, uh, to think about technology problems uh, that they can solve at their level. We don't know what that looks like. Will will those folks be at the uh, uh, you know at the I don't know if the answer to this is but will they be at the company or battalion level uh, in 2030 or will they be at the battalion level or will they be a theater asset? You know we don't know the answers to those questions yet. I don't know what you know for us you know MOS is military occupation specialties. I don't what will be new MOSs that aren't even in the force today in 2030 uh, uh, and which ones of those will be down at a company or a battalion or a brigade level. So I would say it's um, what you see right now is experimentation. What uh, our word is a campaign of learning, right? What you see right now is a campaign of learning. Uh, what you don't see right now is answers uh, in terms of what 2030, what units will look like in 2030, what capabilities, what concepts of operations or doctrine for the employment of some of these new capabilities will be in 2030. What you see is a whole lot of different ways in which we could mix and match and try and make these things work uh, as a part of a campaign of learning. That, so it's great that you're saying that. That's, that goes along with a lot of the work that Dan and I have been doing on mosaic warfare um, mm -hmm. with DARPA, uh, this idea of a recomposable force. So it may not matter really uh, yeah. whether this is a brigade uh, you know, division or yeah. you know, co company level uh, capability because you're going to recompose the force based mm -hmm. on what you need for the task at hand, um, yeah. which creates more adaptability and makes the adversary's job harder. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, obviously. we're trying to create multiple dilemmas. Right, right. And so one of the so one of the challenges I would say it, it seems like could emerge is um, you need to buy a lot of kit. You know, so I'm, to be able to get that recomposability, I need to have enough of the of each of the pieces of equipment that I may, I can distribute them to, you know, multiple units simultaneously and set up mm -hmm. an experiment. Now I'm now I'm actually employing this force. Right. Um, how do you see that? Do you see the the budget challenge being something that's going to you know uh, you know, be a, a problem as you try to then implement the lessons from the campaign of learning? Is that going to get expensive? Uh, or are oh, yeah. you going to think about a redesign of the force that, that makes that a budget neutral proposition? Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's always going to be a challenge. That'd be a challenge, you know, uh, at any budget level, right? You know, we would always find more aggressive and more exciting ways uh, to do things uh, regardless of our budget level. So, so I'll come back to the budget level. But first, you know, so to exactly your point, uh, you know, we have fundamentally changed how we're uh, developing systems, right, uh, with the Army Futures Command. And so one is, you know, one example was the soldier touch points. Uh, so, you know, take IVAS. We just had soldier touch point, I think, four. Uh, uh, the, the developer, in this case, Microsoft, is going back and forth with the soldiers. Um, uh, uh, we've had some systems that are, that are uh, uh, over half a dozen soldier touch points before they even get to uh, prototyping or fielding. Uh, a second is, which I think might have been one of the things you were, you were just suggesting, is uh, the way we've been trying to drive down risk in, into these programs by doing, first we do tech demonstrations. And we might, have, we might carry two, three, four, five uh, vendors through a tech demonstration. Then we might down select the prototyping. We might carry it too, all the way through to prototyping. Uh, and, you know, and so that is, uh, in some ways, uh, that does increase some of the upfront costs. But what, what, you know, what, what, what it does, uh, uh, what it does is it drives down the back end costs, right? You know, uh, a failure, uh, you know, a failure of a system uh, that was in, you know, billions of dollars in development and never fields 
that's that's expensive. Uh, spending a few hundred extra million, uh, and I don't want to make light of that. I mean, we're trying to be good stewards of the taxpayers' resources here, but spending a few extra hundred million to get multiple vendors carried through tech demonstration, carried through the prototyping, uh, but guaranteeing now that we have a system that the soldiers have touched, that we know how to field, we still have more learning to do, but that we know that we can field, uh, and then rolling it out uh, actually cuts uh, cost over the long run, we think. So so that's that's the strategy, which I think is getting at what you were saying. But your specific question was on the budget. Yeah, uh, budget pressure hurts that. There's no question about that. The more money we have, the more of that we can do. Uh, what, you know, what the Army's view, though, is, is we have to modernize. Uh, we have to maintain our overmatch with a near peer adversary. So you know, we're going to stay at it, uh, whether or not it happens in the timeline we like, does it, does it affect timeline, does it affect uh, the breadth at which we ultimately feel, yeah. uh, you know, in tight budget environments, we might stretch a few things, we might uh, uh, not feel things quite as broadly as we'd uh, ultimately like to, and then, you know, at other periods of time, uh, uh, when there's available resources, we can we can catch those things back up. So uh, we view those things as challenges, challenges to work through. Uh, it'll make uh, it'll make some of the folks around here's lives harder. Uh, but you know uh, we're gonna we're gonna build the best armor we can with the resources we have. Uh, and if it causes some things to slow or it causes some things to be narrower in scope at first, you know that's okay. We'll 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 work through that. Uh, we're gonna get there eventually, and we're gonna get it all done. You bet. Um, so uh, thanks, Dr. Whitley. Uh, so I want to incorporate a couple of questions here from the media that have been coming in. Um, so Caitlin Kenny from uh, Defense One uh, wants to know uh, what personnel and quality of life items are being tightened or cut in the 22 budget, such as uh, will maintenance on barracks or facilities be restricted or pay increases frozen or military moves lessened? Yep, I'll leave. I'll leave the um, I'll leave the specifics uh, okay. to the staff when they roll out yeah. the details. But, uh, but we largely protected uh, uh, most of what we were planning to do there. So you're not gonna see big cuts uh, in those areas. Now we have a huge backlog of, of, of issues we'd like to resolve. We'd like to, we have a lot of barracks. Uh, you know, a lot of the focus has been on family housing and we've made a lot of progress there uh, from you know, two or three years ago where we found ourselves in a real problem. We still have some work to do, uh, but we've made a lot of progress there and, and, and our, you know, our partners our privatized housing partners uh, have, uh, you know, almost all now pointed up uh, through investment uh, quite a bit of money. So for us, the next big issue there, uh, or one of the next big issues there is, is the barracks. And we do have a backlog in barracks and we'd like to move through uh, that backlog as quickly as we can. So a tight budget environment means we can't move through that backlog as quickly as we'd like, uh, but we are moving through it and uh, you will see robust funding uh, for that uh, in the budget. So do you, um... Do you see the, um, so as, as, as we uh, emerge out of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, mm -hmm. do you see the recruiting environment becoming um, harder? And are we gonna need to think about, um, you know, having to put more money into these kind of quality of life uh, incentives to, to bring people to do recruiting, recruiting, recruiting and retaining of the force? Uh, you, you know, that certainly plays a role. So, uh, so we certainly do see that. But, you know, the other side of it is, uh, you know, right now, and this gets back to our discussion a few minutes ago about op tempo, uh, operating tempo and the demands placed on the army. Right now, we have a demand that far exceeds, uh, you know, our, our ability to sustain uh, troops in the field uh, with the end strength we have. So we had planned in the 21 to 25, 2021 to 2025 program, we had actually planned uh, uh, a, a fairly substantial uh, continued end strength growth. And we did give that up. Uh, in the 22 to 26 cycle. And we're gonna hold end strength constant at about 485 uh, in this budget. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's gonna create stress on the force. And you know, we thought that was the right thing to do. Um, from a recruiting perspective, that actually makes the problem a little bit easier. Uh, we're recruiting very well this year. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, um, uh, we could easily exceed, uh, you know, we're not going to, we're, we're gonna uh, adjust missions appropriately, uh, but we could have actually easily exceeded 485 this year. Um, so we think we're in a very good place with recruiting. We do expect, uh, you know, as the uh, domestic economy, you know, if it's uh, improving and COVID uh, restrictions are uh, 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 relaxing, uh, we do expect that to create a headwind for us. But with uh, uh, with a reduction, uh, with the elimination of the growth of end strength, which which puts less pressure on recruiting, and then with the successes we're having now, uh, I think we're reasonably confident. 
that we're going to be in good shape. Uh, you know, you could always be overconfident. We don't want to do that. But uh, I think at this point, at this snapshot in time, uh, recognizing that the world could change, at this snapshot in time, we're reasonably confident in our ability to recruit and retain what we need to to stay at 45. Uh, thanks. Um, and uh, so one uh, question that Dan and I discussed earlier, but we didn't raise yet on modernization um, mm -hmm. is uh, relates to uh, a couple of capability areas that the, the Army, one is a longstanding Army capability, uh, Army aviation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as we move into this next phase of essentially the, the future vertical lift program uh, in a tight budget environment, and we're now moving from prototypes to actually trying to make some selections and, and yeah, build yeah. out the program to replace our existing uh, helicopter fleet. Um, are, are we having to make any uh, adjustments or are those going to get delayed or, or extended? No, so in 2022, uh, so both the variants that, uh, that we're working right now, the FARA and the FLARA, uh, uh, both of those remain on track in the 22 submission and it's our intent to, uh, to continue that into the future. So uh, you will not see uh, when folks start to dig into the numbers uh, after Friday, uh, you'll not see uh, uh, any reductions there. And, and then another area is, oh, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, you know, um, the FEL efforts as well, as well as a number of other uh, Army efforts have, have really embraced uh, some, some non-traditional uh, acquisition measures, right? Yeah. Army uh, has taken some really creative approach to thinking about requirements discovery. I mean, you mentioned a little bit of this, of the IVAS system, but it seems like the Army is trying to do this for some of these larger systems as well, as well as extensive use of OTs. Can, can you reflect at all on, on what the Army experience has, has you know, been like trying to embrace and experiment with uh, new mechanisms and authorities here and, and you know, how your read of, of how that's gone so far? So, you know, so you always have to preference an Army modernization conversation with, uh, with an acknowledgement of history. And, you know, the Army's had challenges, right? And, and you know, it's, it, I can admit that because everybody knows it. Uh, when you look at some of the challenges we had 10, 20 years ago. So we knew we had to take a different approach uh, to modernization uh, this time around, uh, number one. Number two, it was occurring at the exact same time as a significant expansion of authorities and uh, increases in flexibility uh, for acquisition. Uh, so, uh, and then, uh, so we've done a couple of things, right? We did an organizational change, the Army Futures Command. That took what was disparate requirements from all over the Army, and you couldn't get your arms around them. You couldn't prioritize them. Everybody was doing their own thing. That brought that together into a central uh, a place where we can prioritize, we can coordinate. Uh, uh, you know, we're never going to do that perfectly, but we're doing that as well as we, as well as we can right now. So, uh, and then... To, uh, and I'm getting to, to kind of the crux of your point. And, you know, we fundamentally change the way we go to and talk to industry, right? Uh, we don't, uh, a, a typical defense model, right, would be you'd spend years writing the perfect requirements document, and then you drop it on industry, right? We don't do that. Now, we go to industry with a problem statement. We say, here is the challenge we have in the future fight. Uh, let's talk about how we might solve that challenge. Uh, and we might talk with many uh, players in industry on that. And we might fund uh, all kinds of uh, very small, uh, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, not millions, not billions, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. We might fund uh, numerous efforts to think about how we're going to solve this problem. We'll eventually evolve that into a requirement. Uh, and then things we've already talked about in this conversation, we will do soldier touch points all along the way. We will do, uh, we will fund uh, multiple uh, vendors through tech demonstration. Maybe we maybe down select to a smaller set, fund them through prototyping, driving a tremendous amount of risk uh, out of uh, the process. So uh, what we found is that the additional authorities have allowed us to do that. Uh, we think so far, we've, we've had some missteps. I mean, uh, but that's, you know, I view that actually as a good thing, right? That means we're pushing the edge and it means that we're trying things and it means that we're recognizing when something's not going in the right direction, we're recognizing it early and correcting it. So, uh, uh, so uh, I think we're doing very well. I think we're using them uh, in a responsible, but very aggressive and clever ways. Uh, the other thing I'd say though is, is you know, uh, we have to be responsible with it uh, because you know there is the risk that we'll take uh, that we'll uh, uh, do things uh, 
uh, that could be perceived as irresponsible at some point. We're not doing that now, I don't think. But uh, if you if you stray into that territory, then you're going to lose some of these uh, authorities, right? And so we're trying to be very cognizant that uh, can we defend what we're doing? Can we explain what we're doing? Can we justify it? Uh, and you know, we want things to fail. I don't mean that in the way that obviously you want things to fail. What I mean that is we want to be out there trying a lot of things and we recognize that we're gonna have failures along the way. That means we're being aggressive. That means we are experimenting. Uh, uh, but uh, can we keep that to a manageable level so that we don't, uh, so we don't lose the trust and confidence of the Congress, of the think tank community, of the American people. So um, very exciting time in modernization and acquisition. You bet. Uh, one, one last question, sir, uh, from, from the press. Uh, Gordon Lubold from uh, Wall Street Journal wants to know about um, Afghanistan and what the drawdown in Afghanistan might be yielding in terms of uh, either you know, obviously there's some reduction in the people that are, are deployed overseas, but um, are there other pieces of equipment or um, other reductions that are gonna be able to be harvested or other efficiencies that can be harvested as a result of the drawdown there? Yep, so, well, so let me, let, me, let, me, uh, let me jump straight to kind of the tactical points on that. So, so um, uh, there, there, there will be a reduction in resources overall uh, through the out years. Uh, and so that money has been uh, taken. What you'll see in the Army's budget when it, uh, you know, uh, when this broadcasts on Friday, uh, you'll see a reduction in the Army's top line. But a lot of that reduction is a reduction requirement from Afghanistan and the Middle East, uh, resulting in a reduction uh, in funding level. What you'll see in the 22 uh, budget is a funding level for what we currently believe the requirements will be. That's the broader theater. But with respect to Afghanistan, that'll be the over the horizon. Uh, uh, support and the other types of things. The challenge the army faces is that's an imprecise, you know, trying to predict today in the middle of the retrograde uh, what the requirements will be uh, uh, in 2022. Uh, we know whatever we're predicting will be wrong. Uh, and uh, so this gets back to the conversation I had at the very beginning about uh, that there's risk in the army budget. Uh, we've taken prudent risks uh, through the night court process to fund modernization. Um, we have risk in the budget with respect to uh, uh, Afghanistan and the Middle East uh, more broadly. We've, uh, what you'll see in the 22 values are uh, our best guess, our best estimate of what the requirement will be for the follow on requirements uh, following the retrograde. Um, if, uh, if the bill is bigger, uh, then that means we have uh, one more pressure on the Army's budget, and we're going to have to figure out how to resolve that. Uh, if the requirement is lower, that would be great. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't seen the, the Army's experiences. We haven't seen that in a long time where, the, where uh, execution year comes in below uh, the funding level, the funded level. But, uh, but we, can all, uh, we can all be optimistic that maybe this will be a, a first. Yeah, that we always uh, hope it springs eternal. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Um, and, uh, and a related question that um, we had was related to, it sounds like uh, there's not a lot of uh, equipment like uh, missile defense batteries or anything else that's gonna be able to come out of the Middle East as a result of this change that could be redistributed elsewhere. It sounds like we're there's, looking at you know, mainly a, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, really the experts in theater need to talk yeah. about the equipment. You know, what I, what I can just say as a strategic level, and I, you know, I, 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 I observed this, but I'm not the decision maker here, right? This is really the folks in theater and, and the, the combatant commander. But, you know, there's really three, three buckets, right? There's equipment that, that we return and retrograde with the forces. There's equipment that we turn over to the Afghan forces. And then there's equipment that it's not economical. You know, there's no need for it to stay. It's not economical to return. And so it gets destroyed or, or done uh, something else with. So, you know, that work's been done. Uh, it's been done uh, very exhaustively. Uh, by the by, the folks in theater, and and you know they can walk you through. You can get the right folks to to walk you through. You know what what kind of went in which bucket and why, and uh, the relative sizes of those buckets. You bet. Uh, well, um, well, Mr. Secretary, uh, I want to be mindful of your time, um, yep. and also we really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you. And given you know the the proximity of the budget and and all the dynamic changes going on for the Army, I really appreciate you taking time out of what is probably a very busy day to to chat with us. Um, before we go, I didn't know if there's anything else you wanted to mention before we close. 
Oh, well, no, I just say, I, I, I just make two comments. First is, is to you and to your colleagues there, thank you very much. Thank you for what you do. You know, I, I'm an analyst by training. I've, I've moved in and out of the analytic community. So I, uh, you know, you, you're an essential part of the conversation. You're an essential part of the information that we draw on uh, for our decision making. So I, I very much appreciate what you do. I very much appreciate you putting together sessions like this. It's helpful for us uh, as well and hopefully helpful helpful for you as well. So number one is just uh, thank you uh, for what you're doing and, and for this session and, and what you do more broadly. And then number two is uh, to you and to the American people, anybody who, who watches this video, uh, I just wanna say, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, what an incredible army we have today. Uh, we talked a lot about what we've done in readiness. Uh, we've talked about what we're doing in modernization. Uh, and really, uh, when you think about the Army, what we really are is our people. And uh, the Army, uh, we've always had good people. The Army uh, today is some of the best people we've ever had. Uh, our soldiers and our civilians uh, uh, go out there and make the American people proud every single day, whether it's at a COVID vaccination site, uh, securing DC or fighting in the Middle East or, or in the Pacific or Europe or Africa or South America. Uh, so I just want you and, and, and everybody who watches this to know uh, just uh, uh, what your army does uh, for the American people each and every day uh, and, and what good shape our army is in today. And it's because of our people and it's because of the support of, of Congress and the American people and, and folks like you. So, uh, so thank you and I, I really enjoyed this and I thank you for, uh, for setting it up. Well, thank you very much, sir. Uh, so thank you, uh, uh, Acting Army Secretary, Dr. John Whitley uh, for being with us today. Uh, I thank Dr. Dan Pat uh, from the Hudson Institute for, for being here with us as well and as well as the, the media uh, participants we had. Uh, we all appreciate your, your uh, watching this video and uh, from the Hudson Institute, have a good day.